Okay, guys, welcome to lesson 16. Um, this is going to be the bulk of our art history from our non-Western parts of the world, um, or really just non-European. We'll still talk about the um, traditional American arts as well. Um, so yeah, lesson 16 is, it, like I said, it's a very, very long lesson. So I'm going to break it into two parts in case you can't watch the whole thing in one sitting. Um, so in this video, we'll cover the traditional arts of Asia and Africa. And then in the second video, we'll cover the arts of Asia and Africa. Um, all of our like little sections that we'll talk about um, are going to have a map that looks kind of similar to this on there. If you're following along in the PowerPoint as well, you're more than welcome to look back on these later on to kind of see where each of the little um, like the, the locations and like the, um, the the spaces that we're talking about are located on the map. But you're you don't have to do that if you don't want to, but it's there for you if you'd like. Um, so we'll talk about the art of Asia. It's This is probably our biggest section because Asia is such a large country um, and we have different regions of Asia that sort of have different customs and beliefs um, and ideas. So we're gonna start off with India. Um, regardless of really the area of, of any part of the world during these like early art forms we'll talk about, um, religion is highly, highly influential for um, the artwork that, and the architecture that's being created. Some spiritual leaders that we see in India in the sixth century is um, from Buddhism and Jainism, mostly Buddhism though. We'll also talk a bit about Hinduism as well. Um, Buddhist art, there is a belief that, so I'll give a little bit of history about each of the religions, just so you have something to kind of go off of if you're not familiar with the religions. Um, Buddhist art um, is th with the beliefs that to eliminate desire, which is their cause of suffering, one must follow the moral code of the Eightfold Path. This did not initially allow for the production of images, um, but after a while, people really wanted those icons to support their contemplation. Um, and so we start to see them later on in the religion. The artistic and architectural styles are highly influenced by regional cultures. The first part I'm gonna talk about here is um, the architecture that we see. And just like the other architecture lesson we went over, Early architecture, more so like the monuments we still see today, are those of like religious or ceremonial importance. It's not like where they lived at or where their shops were, things like that. It's it's usually the most ornate and the most structurally sound um, architecture is that of the religious importance. Um, a stupa is a dome-like structure that evolved from earlier burial mounds. Um, there's always four gates that are aimed in the cardinal directions, northwest, east, and south. And the devout were meant to walk around this ritual path to contemplate, to meditate, to just um, be at one with their religion and with, you know, their gods. Um, and so this is the great stupa of Sanchi that you're seeing in both of these images here. It's built over a period of about 200 years. Super, super ornate. The gateways include um, layers of sculpture in relief, specifically low relief sculpture that we see here. And um, it tells the story of Buddha's life. It never depicts him directly because that is not really something that's being done early on. Um, but yeah, it's just super, super ornate. Definitely justifies 200 years of, of work. Um, again, just a little background on the religion of um, Buddhism, but Sava is a figure who delays their enlightenment to help others achieve it. Um, a lot of the times before Buddha is actually depicted, we see that there is Bhatsava is depicted because they have not reached enlightenment. And so they are technically okay to be shown in this imagery. Sculptors, are sh sculptors show knowledge of Roman Greek traditions and depicts with um, rich garments and jewels most of the time. A lot of the time, oh, sorry, um, a lot of the time um, there is very rich symbolism in sculpture and in artwork in general around this time period. For example, when we start to actually see this, the actual Buddhist figures being shown, um, we always see them with like these elongated ear earlobes that um, represent, represented um, aristocracy and a top knot that symbolized enlightenment kind of a juxtaposition between the Batsaba. They do have sort of like a little cap or something like that that's sort of similar to a top knot, but not the way that the Buddha, this is a very, very um, notable look for the Buddha statues is this type of top knot. Um, as well as this circle in the background here, 
Um, it's very small. Usually, sometimes it's more ornate than others, but that's to symbolize religious importance. And this sort of crosses through a lot of religions, whether it be um, Christianity, whether it be, you know, um, Buddhism, Hinduism, we see this halo backing religious figures a lot. Um, another thing is the traditional monk garment that we see in this figure and in this one here. Um, another thing, and we've talked about this in our color chapter, <laughs> color chapter previously, um, but color is very reflective of the pigment in that area, especially traditionally before we have like mass production of color pigment that is synthetic. So um, in India, a lot of the times these rich yellows and blues are what is known for that region. And even without the content, we can know that, you know, if these colors are present, we can kind of tell where they're coming from in the world. Um, the style, this is called the beautiful Batsava. Um, it's a, a fresco painting done. There's a lot of fine linear definition and elegance, um, full rounded body shapes. And then the style is spread onto Buddhism in China and Southeast Asia. I think to contradict, especially when we get into lesson 17 and you start to see like the depiction of a lot of European figures, it feels like this is in, in comparison, much softer, um, much more fine, elegant, um, fluid, and just, just a lot softer overall than the depictions that we see later. Um, Hinduism is also a very popular religion around this time as well. Um, instead of just having the one God, they have three principal gods, the Brahma, the Vishnu, and the Shiva. Um, and they have Hindu temples that are kind of similar to the stupas. There's two parts. There's a porch for purification of the worshiper. And that's where the, um, the worshiper is meant to be, or like the, the followers are meant to be at. And then the Garbhagriya, which is a sacred wound chamber, chamber where an image of the God is kept. Each temple is used for different um, or for a different one of the three gods. Um, this one specifically is for the Shiva. Um, and yeah, so there's there's a deep womb chamber where an image of the god is kept. And then the the worshiper, the follower just um, exists on the porch and it's just meant to sort of like walk in contemplation. Um, some more artwork, especially sculpture. Um, this is a piece of the Shiva. Um, it encompasses, and each, each of the gods have different principles and like characteristics that they follow and they're supposed to embody. The Shiva encompasses creation, preservation, dissolution, and recreation. And um, the roles are shown in sculpture with their rich iconography. This is Shiva as Lord of the Dance, which um, Shiva is performing within the orb of the sun, the circle there is the sun, and tramples the mo monster of ignorance that we see down here below. Um, we see that they are pr uh, purifying the fire of destruction and creation. And there's the implica implica <laughs> implication of movement where multiple arms and gestures are being shown here. Um, this is a great example of showing uh, motion in like a still singular flat image um, where all these hands are sort of dancing around the sun here and moving and implying a sense of motion, as well as the use of diagonal line throughout the entire body um, shows that this is Definitely not something like vertical or horizontal that is either, you know, standing strong and, you know, sturdy or at rest. Um, moving on to the art of Asia in China and Korea. Um, this is a, so the interaction of traditions of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism are prior to the modern period. And those are really prevalent. Um, in, in their artwork. They focus on the importance of personal ethics and morality and believe in the spiritual immorality where the spirit of the body joins the universe after death. Um, think about movies that you've seen even that kind of like display this culture, such as Mulan, where, you know, they have these big giant sh family shrines that honor their, their relatives after their death. And they believe that, you know, they carry on even when they're not actually physically there. Um, people look to them to protect them and to guide them and to give them power and um, knowledge. And yeah, it's just, uh, it, it's it's very notable in their culture. This is um, the Emperor, Q, I'm just going to call him Emperor Q, um, his temple. So after he died, and he, he was someone who was known for unifying China after, before his death 
in 210 BCE. Um, so he was very intent upon guarding his afterlife. He had about 6,000 terracotta warriors made to protect him in his tomb. Um, you may have seen, if you've ever watched like the old Indiana Jones movies or anything, um, these sculptures actually like come to, they're used for something else, like a treasure or something, but um, they actually come to life and like they have to fight them off to to get to wherever they're going. But um, yeah, this is, this is really, really iconic imagery here to see all these like little tiny figurines that are guarding um emperor q in his afterlife um another family shrine this is done in a low relief very very low relief um this is the Wu family shrine it's captured in stone and um it's supposed to have very full energy and inner life force or chi as you will um this gets a little bit lengthy here so i'm going to try to go through this as kind of quickly as possible if you feel like you need to go back and read some of the the specific history, feel, feel free to do that if you're following along on the PowerPoint. Um, so the Chinese painting tradition has a lot of influence from calligraphy as well. And calligraphy and landscape painting really started to interact. Um, the same brushes and the ink is used for both types, both calligraphy and watercolor. Um, Fang Quan, he is a master landscape painter of the Song Dynasty, which is between 960 and 1279, um, very, very early on dynasty. Um, his imaginative and creation is intended to capture the energy of nature, not necessarily a real place. Um, it, this is very, very detailed, but again, it's important to note that his painting here is not like in reaction to a real place. As we move on past the Song Dynasty, um, it's displaced in 1125. There is a new painting style that emerges that emphasizes a smaller, more intimate landscape as we see here that's more focused on on a scene or like just smaller details. This is Ma Wan um, and they were more so interested in capturing this, um, this feeling or emotion and sort of combining ideas of art and poetry into one scene. There's a meticulous brushwork that fades into the mist into like these multiple layers and sort of an off balance composition as well. Um, literati painting is something that's really, really popular um, as well after the Song Dynasty is displaced. This is when amateurs that are devoting their lives to art and poetry and um th they're just academics and in intellects if you will um they start to try to combine some of these these ideas together to make painting more than just something pretty but to you know discuss something to be about something to talk about the human experience um this is a scroll done in an academic style um it's it's been taught it's a very like formulatic way of of creating a landscape painting um, and a lot of the times scrolls were the format of of these paintings as well so you could actually like roll them up and sometimes calligraphy interacted with them and all of that there's a deep respect for the past um, and like following tradition and, and not really changing it so much but just you know perfecting it and and honoring it and um, you know just carrying on the tradition uh, the Chinese literati painters, um, they developed the development of Chinese painting in the Ming dynasty and later is seen here. There's a big contradiction between academic versus literati styles. This is a literati painting. It's cicada on a banana leaf. And the literati artists, they really start to boil down to like very simplified forms and shapes and just like the, the, be like the beauty and the sort of poetry that exists within the calligraphy work. And so it's very intentional that this piece is so simplified. You can tell the brush strokes, like, you know, how it's been hit, how hard or how light it's been bared down. Um, and it just feels like you have a deeper understanding and connection with like the medium and maybe like the artist and like, you know, feeling about this piece as well. The cicada that we see up here is a symbol of rebirth as well. There's a lot of symbolism that we see sort of coming through with literati paintings like that. Some Chinese ceramics that are important to note, they're held in very high regard. This is a porcelain piece, which was like the most popular, you know, form of ceramics in China. Um, they are like a powerhouse for this, this type of production. Um, porcelain turns white when it's fired. And so that's why you get that like really crisp white in the background there. And initially only blue was the color that could withstand higher temperatures. So that's why you, you, even today you might, you know, like your grandma or even your mom, maybe, um, an aunt and uncle probably has a set of china or plates that are kind of done maybe not with like a fish in the middle but maybe like a farmhouse or 
you know, something like that's shown. This is a super, super popular style and it still is for a long time. This is made in the 14th century. Um, but yeah, super, super popular style, super ornate, just a miraculous amount of detail, really. In Korea, we start to see kind of similar, you know, uh, variations from this. They use more of a blue green celadon glaze for their work. And it's not always porcelain that the clay is made. This is actually stoneware. Um, a new style of decoration is sort of seen as in the wine pitcher where we etch shapes and then fill them with white or black slip glaze. And then we do a second firing with like the celadon, like blue green glaze that we see there. Lastly, we're going to talk about the art of Asia and Japan. Um, so the architecture here, it almost seems like, you know, we see these temples and shrines and um, stupas and, you know, all of these different kind of buildings. And they, they seem to all kind of be in reaction to one another. Um, Shinto is the religion that Japan, that Japan follows, like primarily, especially early on. These, this is a religion that deals with nature and ancestor worship. Um, and they believe that the gods dwell in the forest fields, waterfalls, and huge stones. Um, this is the Ize Shrine. It's rebuilt every 20 years. A big part of the Shinto religion is um, being able to let go, let go, not be not become too attached to things that are worldly. Um, and so that's why it is remade every 20 years to sort of symbolize that belief. Um, this combines simplicity with subtlety, and um, it's always rebuilt in this sacred site within a forest. This is the Katsura Detached Palace. It's a blend of human-made and natural elements. Um, we see a sliding screen door that allows for indoor and outdoor flow. There's no grand entrance, um, and it is a tea house, which constructed of common natural materials and embodies attitudes of simplicity, naturalness, and humility. So it's it doesn't want to obstruct the landscape. It just kind of wants to, like, coexist with it um, and not, not be burdensome or too out of place, I would say. It's very humble. Um, and yeah, um, something else to kind of know in the Kamakuri period with sculpture, painting and prints, um, there's this attachment to vigorous realism. This piece here, you can tell there's so much more realism done with it um, than some of the previous ones, but it is still has this softness to it that I really admire as well. Um, another thing to note with the paintings, hand scrolls are suited for more longer narratives, but the Shinto religion really shines through with some of these scrolls. The subjects are depicted with wild vi vividness. Um, this is the illustrated legends of the Katano shrine, and it narrates early history of the important Shinto site. This shows the thunder god wrecking havoc on a courtly gathering, and the scroll reflects a strong role that nature plays in the Shinto beliefs. So uh, lots of times there's other depictions of um, like flood gods, storm gods, natural phenomena gods, um, and whatnot to show like the implications of, you know, not following this belief and not being devout in the religion. Um Zen Buddhism is another um, religion that starts to form in Japan around this time as well. Um, we start to see that there is, uh, with this religion, enlightenment through meditation, um, fate, or spontaneous timing. This is Hiboku's splashed ink landscape, and it's inspired by the Southern Song Masters. There's a suggestion of line and forms and like a landscape happening right here. However, this empty space up at the top here, I think, is really telling for Zen Buddhism. Whereas, you know, you do have like these grounding earthly things, but from meditation comes this emptiness and this, um, this sort of just vastness of space. We talked about folding screens a little bit early on, and I believe our principles of design lesson where um, folding screens are very functional in homes. However, they oftentimes are depicting different like landscapes and things like that. I think I showed you one with a crane to sort of symbolize um, the element of rhythm and repetition. But again, emphasis on repeated patterns, repetition, rhythm is is really, really popular um, in in these screens. Just that that rhythm, just sort of like that point of interest um, that comes from the variety of it. Um, Yukioi is a style of woodcut printing um, where we capture more scenes of daily life, landscapes, entertainers, actors, things that didn't really get to their moment in the sun that much. It was more so reserved for landscapes and you know, religious figures and things like that. But um, Yukioi is is really focusing on the more like inner beauty and um, showing ordinary subjects and turning them into 
memorable images using more flat shapes with lack of shading as well. Um, and oftentimes a cropped composition to kind of like focus in on the individual instead of it being a more generalized image. Okay, go to the next video, 16, lesson 16, part two, and we will talk about the art of Africa and um, the remainder of the lesson as well.